Our gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for this Lord's Day. And we thank you that we have the privilege to be able to gather together as your people and to study the historic doctrines of your church. We thank you for those who have gone before us, for those who have wrestled with these difficult doctrines and have so sought to express them in writing. And we thank you for the translators who have provided translations for us uh, that we may continue to derive uh, good understanding truths that are conveyed to us through your word. We pray that uh, you would guide us and direct us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are to the portion of the Heidelberg Catechism uh, that uh, begins with, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then what follows after that? the Holy Catholic Church, and so forth and so on. And so the question today is, what do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? Let's look at the answer, and then we'll go into this in greater detail. I believe believe that the Son of God, through His Spirit and Word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. And of this community, I am and always will be a living member. Wow. That, that is a really good, thorough statement of what we might refer to as the universal church or what has historically been referred to as Catholic the universal or Catholic church. Uh, So let's start here, and this is important for us to understand, especially in terms of our understanding of the church. And the first question I want us to consider is, how does Christ build His church? How does Christ build His church? Good marketing all right, through, through uh, those who uh, believe, those who profess the, the faith and come to saving faith in Christ. How else? How does Christ build His church? All right, the building in terms of, of growth, uh, the, to grow up in Christ, to be uh, sanctified. Uh, who is it? Maybe that this is a, a better lead-in. Who is it that builds Christ? The Holy Spirit. And I think that, that's an important place for us to start, and that's why I've, I've posed the question the way that I have, is that it is very easy for us to think uh, that we are the ones who build the church uh, through marketing efforts, through programs, through uh, whatever, what, what have you. And, and of course, many of us are aware that this is sort of the dilemma of our age in which the church has sought to try to appeal to culture. And we know that when the church begins to try to appeal to culture, what happens to the church? The church becomes like culture, right? And, and, and so uh, it, it is important for us to understand that, first of all, we are not the ones that build the church. I'll remember, and I've told this story before, so you bear with me for those that have not heard uh, the story before. But in, in the early years after planting this church, uh, we had the opportunity to have the late uh, Jerry Bridges come and uh, do a weekend uh, preaching uh, seminar with us. And it was a sweet time as Jerry was nearing uh, death. And um, we also had the opportunity to have Jerry and his wife in our home because she was on a special diet. And so we were trying to cater to that. And uh, we had at, that, at, the ta- at the dinner table, we had invited for one meal, my parents and my in-laws. And we're sitting there with Jerry and his wife talking. And my mother-in-law said, Jerry, how are we going to build this church? Because nobody in this area knows anything about Reformed theology. And Jerry did not turn in response to her. 
not out of disrespect, but rather he wanted to make a point in answering the question. And he looked down the table and he pointed his finger at me and he said, Preach the Word. Preach the Word in season and out of season. And, and it gripped me, and it, it still stays with me to this day, especially uh, when I am tempted to be distracted by so many different things and the, the thousand things that a pastor could get distracted by in a week to remember, preach the Word. It is the Holy Spirit then who uses the means of grace. We'll gather across the street today, and the Word will be preached, but... It is not my eloquence, or lack thereof, it is not my knowledge, it is not whatever the case may be related to me, but that it is the Holy Spirit who works through the preaching of the Word. And it is the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to life, who sanctifies us, and it's the Holy Spirit who builds His church through the preaching of the Word, through the administration of the sacraments, and through the prayer uh, and worship of His people. And so that's why oftentimes you'll hear, hear me refer to our church as an ordinary means of grace church. And what, me, what we mean by that, that's a good Presbyterian term uh, to put into your ready vocabulary because it comes from the, the shorter, actually shorter and larger catechism. The ordinary means of grace of church is one that doesn't get distracted with all of these different things. There are so many things that we could do as a church, but our primary focus is word, sacrament, and prayer. That's what we do, and the reason we do that is those are the means of grace that the Holy Spirit works through and builds the church in terms of numbers, but so also, as Kim pointed out, so also builds the church in terms of our maturity. And so Christ builds His church through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How is God then fulfilling the promise to Abraham to multiply his offspring as the stars of heaven? That's the second question. It implies that you have a knowledge of God's promise to Abraham. Uh, God told Abraham to come out of the tent, to look up to the sky, and told him that his offspring would be uh, as the stars of heaven, which uh, was a Hebraic expression, meaning you can't count them all. That's how many there, there will be. Uh, how is God fulfilling that promise to Abraham? That's right. By, by the Holy Spirit's ministry of drawing a people to Him. Uh, if you're reading through our Bible reading plan, which I hope that you are, I encourage you are, be in the Word every single day, you, you're in the book of Acts right now. And one of the things that Luke does in the book of Acts is he is consistently using language to make sure that the reader understands that the Holy Spirit is at work at drawing a people to God and that includes, surprise, surprise, to the Jewish nation, Gentiles. And it's so astounding that you may recall that even the apostles were like, what in the world is going on here? Well, Paul is going out and, 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 and the people that are professing faith in Christ, they're being filled with the Holy Spirit and, and there's a witness of God's work among those that oh, gasp aren't even circumcised, right? You remember that in the, in the book of Acts. And we see that now carrying forward, as I've said before in our church services, we're a witness to that, right? I mean, we would not, as a church, we would not exist were it not for the Holy Spirit advancing the gospel through the means of missionaries coming to this area. I have a book on my desk of the history of Presbyterianism in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And uh, it's a real page turner. Um, <laughs> it was actually published back in the in the in the '60s uh, by First Presbyterian just down the the street. And uh, but it's got a, a really good little history. But but the the, the short version. It's also got a great picture of 1960s. The minister standing in front of the door at First Presbyterian, wearing the exact to a T black robe that I wear. 
So not much has changed in Presbyterian circles in that in our attire, um, but but it, 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 the the story is the advancement of the gospel to an area, and we're the recipients of that, and that is how God is fulfilling His promise to Abraham. It's through Christ's great commission. What then does the word church mean, and when did the church come into existence? So let's start, those are two questions. Let's start with the first one, but they're related questions, right? So first of all, what does the word church mean? All right, so the word, we'll we'll just work uh, our way in English, and then we'll go back to the Greek, and then we'll go to, to the Hebrew. So our English word, church, Related, for example, uh, to the Scots word of kirk, you can see the, the semblance in the sound, is a full translation, not a translation, of the Greek word eglesia. That's an English transliteration of the word eglesia. The word eglesia is a translation of the Hebrew word that means assembly. So when, for example, when you're reading in the Old Testament and you read that the people of God, that Israel assembled, for example, at the tabernacle, same word as eglesia in, no, not G, good grief. I'm sorry. I've been on vacation. And I wasn't parsing Greek verbs on vacation, right? Uh, In the translation, it's E-C-C-L-E-S-I, ecclesia. Um, But the same word, and as it is translated into English. Now, here's the problem and and the the, the morphology, so to speak, of words. in modern evangelicalism, church has a multitude of different uh, meanings. Could be referred to as a building, um, could be referred to as just a New Testament experience. Um, and for example, when I was in, in seminary, uh, at, a, at a Baptist seminary, uh, the professor had a, a, a writing that required that um, we... Uh, had, it was a, regarding um, explaining uh, the, the coming into existence in, of, of the church in the church age. And I, and I emailed him back and, and I said, um, I'm unwilling to answer the question that way. Uh, I'm a Presbyterian. Um, so the church age didn't begin when you think it did. The church age, so to speak, uh, has been in existence for a long time. Based on the definition of this, he gave me clearance and, and I, I got an A on the paper, so there was no problem there. Uh, but it's a different understanding of the church. So if the church is the assembly, if the church is that ecclesia which we read about within the New Testament, then when did the church come into existence? Any former Lutherans here, incidentally? This is, this is a favorite question for, the, for a Lutheran. And, 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 and the reason why is because uh, the Lutherans will talk about uh, the three, we'll call it, for lack of a better word, uh, sovereign spheres uh, of God. Uh, God works through the family. God works through uh, government. God works through the church. It's why you'll never hear, sometimes you'll hear evangelicals say, well, if the church wasn't just doing, getting taken care of the homeless, then then we wouldn't have homeless. And the Lutheran would say, well, no, God created government to help with that. And since God is sovereign and ordains all things, then He works through those means. So He works through government, He works through the family, He works through the church. We see within Scripture a form of the church beginning with whom? Adam and Eve. And so we would say that the church, the assembly of God's elect, of God's saints, 
is that gathering of Adam and Eve before the fall. And so the assembly of God's people goes all the way back to the beginning, carries through, and as our larger catechism says, is is sometimes more and sometimes less holy. (laughs) And so in the time of, for example, the the Reformation, and the reason the Reformation was was needed because the, the, the church, at least the Western church as it was, had become so corrupt uh, there's a requirement of the reforming uh, of it. But the church is the assembly of uh, God's people, which has been and will continue to be onward into existence. How does God gather, protect, and preserve for Himself a community chosen for eternal life? How does God gather... I've included these words here to tie in uh, with the Heidelberg Catechism. How does God gather, protect, and preserve for Himself a community chosen for eternal life? Well, we've already talked about gather, so I'll take that one for you. So we, the, the Lord, God gathers His people by virtue of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who, who draws them in. Uh, I mean, I'll give you a, a great story, uh, and I wish she were here because she could tell the story better than I, uh, but one of our, our church members uh, tells the story uh, when she was on her way to Mass at the Catholic Church and was running so late that she decided not to go in there. And uh, she said, you know, I'd always wanted to go see what it was like in that church down on 9th and B Street. And so she just decided, I'm just going to turn and go go in there. And she said, I I went in there and uh, even though the preaching wasn't very good, the Holy... No, she didn't say that. She, she, She said... You were speaking to me. It was as if I was the only one in the room. And I said, I wasn't speaking to you. The Holy Spirit was, because that's how He works. And He orchestrated that you were late for Mass. And He orchestrated that you would turn and pull into our parking lot. And He orchestrated that you would walk into our service so that He could speak through you through what? is ordinary means of grace, word, sacrament, and, and prayer. And it's just a beautiful reminder that that's how he governs his church, gathers his church. But how does he protect and preserve his people, his church? That's a great point, J.D., a reminder that that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to life. J.D. used the theological term regeneration, um, which is a a sort of a transliteration of the Greek word that means to be rebirthed. And it's what is translated a lot of times in our English translation as born again. This is what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus, right? Unless the Holy Spirit draws, Jesus says, Nicodemus, the Holy Spirit works kind of like a wind, You've heard me explain before, the word for spirit and the word for wind are the same word in Greek. And the Holy Spirit works like the wind. He works as He pleases and He draws, but it's the Holy Spirit who brings us to life. We are born again through the Holy Spirit. And it's only through that that we are brought to life in Christ. And as J.D. pointed out, otherwise we would, have, we would want nothing to do with God unless the Holy Spirit brings us to life. Certainly. Right. Right. Yeah. So for the sake of the recording, I'm just going to summarize. What, what he said was, is that having been not raised a Roman Catholic, when you hear the word Catholic, it's hard to escape from 
the, the, that referring to the Roman Catholic Church, and, and that sort of sticks with you. Um, all right, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a little help. I'll put it this way. Um, we are reformed and reforming Catholics. In fact, just a little point, we talked about this the other day, when Calvin was writing his institute, which arguably had the greatest impact on Protestants out of every other work of Christian literature, he considered himself a Catholic. If you'd, if you'd walked in and said, Calvin, are you a Catholic? And he'd be like, what kind of question is that? Of course I'm a Catholic. Now, I'm in protest at the moment. Uh, Calvin supposedly in his lifetime thought before he died that the Western church would be reformed and would, would come to a right understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, that was not the case then, nor is it the case today. Uh, but nevertheless, we're still in protest. We're, we're, we're Catholics, but we're Catholics who are in protest. And so uh, to, to say that, now, with that being said, I'm saying that to help us wrap our mind around it. But that it's also good for us to be faithful to historic words. And we need not let those who have perhaps abused a term to hold license to it. So I'll give you another example if this helps you wrap your mind around it. When we planted this church we were encouraged by our, the, the, our sponsor church to drop the word Presbyterian. And um, I, I said, no, we, 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 we cannot do that. And, and here's why. That, that, and the reason they wanted us to drop it is because, as many of you know, when someone, oh, you're a Presbyterian, and they'll think some of the social problems and certainly theological problems with mainline Presbyterianism in the United States. And with that comes a sort of stigma. But my response was, is I'm not going to let the abuse of that term rob us of a rich history. Um, Sean Lucas has written a wonderful book called A Continuing Church. And he goes back and goes all the way back to the beginning of the Presbyterian Church in 1560 and goes all the way through to the PCA today. And it's a, it's a brilliant reminder that this little bitty blip that we're in where Presbyterianism holds a negative connotation because of the theological fall and social fall of mainline Presbyterianism, uh, it, there's no reason for us to coalesce. And so uh, the, the, I carry that the same way with Catholic. I mean, you know, we, we, we are uh, Catholics. We're just Catholics in protest. Uh, reforming uh, is... You know, that civil engineer back there with the white shirt on. Um, good grief. Phil. Sorry, Phil. I, yeah, I know. Well, I, look, I've done enough to confuse everyone. Um, at the moment, my brain's on pause. Uh, but but, but uh, Phil, Phil said one time, isn't it true that we're reformed and always reforming? And, and, and in a sense, that, that's true and that we're faithful to the Reformation, but there's still a reforming. And R.C. Sproul made this very clear uh, in his argument against uh, Protestants and Catholics together is that uh, there's still much work to be done. And until the church comes back together, there's more to be done. Yeah, Chris. No, I was just saying that to help us wrap our mind around it. Not, and you're, you're doing a good job of bringing us back on course. What they're doing in this, this, tra this is translated from German and later translated from uh, Latin, but, but what they're doing is they're just using that uh, traditional word that we understand to mean universal. So you're, you're exactly right. Any other questions or comments on that? That's a good one, and I know a lot of people uh, find that word odd. Um, but, and I, I know I'm rambling, bear with me. But 
Michael Horton has a great book, and I recommend it actually, uh, called A Better Way, and it's talking about reformed worship. The whole book's about reformed worship. And in that book, he gives the analogy of sports. He said that if you take up, for example, the game of golf, there are a number of terms that you have to learn to be able to even know what you're talking about in playing the, 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 the game. Or if you come fly fishing with me and I ask you wh what size lead are you using, how long is your tippet, and what size fly are you throwing, and is it dry or wet fly, if you're not a fly fisherman, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you are, you can answer me in about five seconds. And what, what Michael Horton says in a better way is he says, that is the case with not just sports, but it is the case with any kind of organization. There is always a vocabulary, always a nomenclature that accompanies that institution. And he said, I don't understand why evangelicals think that the church would be any different. Like you're supposed to walk into a Presbyterian church and because we use the word Catholic, somehow that's offensive. Instead, what Horton says is, Learn the vocabulary, man. Everything has its own vocabulary, and so learn the vocabulary. To where when somebody in Sunday school uses the word regeneration, nobody's going, g -g 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 what? No, we understand those terms, but I digress. All right, so going back to our, our outline um, of protecting and preserving for himself, I'll just say this, is that what we see in Scripture is that there is the surety of Christ's church. So, for example, when someone says, Oh, the church, I, the church is not going to survive in America, and, and, and eventually, you know, there's just there's going to be two of us. The church is dying in, in, in America. All you can go is, is say is, um, Look, I would agree with you if it was up to you, it would die. And if it was up to me, it would die faster. But it's not up to you. It's not up to me. Christ shall always have a church forever and ever. It may wane. The, 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 Christ was, I mean, the church was a beautiful thing once upon a time in Scotland. And today, the majority of the Scots are unbelievers. The fastest growing religion, I'm told by a friend of mine uh, in, in uh, Scotland, is pantheism. And yet, we see that the church and a remnant survives. You see that through the Old Testament. You see that in the New Testament. You see it to this day. Don't you worry about it. There will always be a church because God protects His church. He builds His church. He preserves His church. He protects His church by His Holy Spirit who is actively at work in and through His elect. What is then the essence of the church's unity? That's the next question on your, your outline. I'll remind you that the essence of the unity is the Holy Spirit's presence through the ordinary means of grace. Today... It's the first Sunday of the month. This is the, the Sunday that we typically uh, will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Today, through the fellowship of believers, as Christ has promised to be present in our, our assembly, in our fellowship, through our prayers, I'll remind you that we believe that singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs are just prayers set to word. Think about that today while you're singing that hymn or that, that psalm. That's a prayer. We pray through the singing. We, bless, we are blessed through the fellowship, through the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant word, through the preaching of the word, through the administer of the Lord's Supper where Christ is spiritually present and we are fed and nourished through the prayers of His people. All of this uh, we see in our unity. And so we are unified not through programs. We are unified uh, not through uh, trying to sit down and work through a, a, a uh, church-wide counseling session. I heard about a church split that was happening and they brought in all of these, these counselors and they were trying to work through this and, and it's like, it's not working. Like, 
Well, of course it's not. If you want to unify the church, call everybody in and tell them to get on their knees. Tell them to fast and pray. Tell them to be under the preaching of God's Word. Administer the sacrament. Teach them through the guidance of the Holy Spirit forgiveness that we forgive our debtors as we are likewise forgiven as debtors. What are several defining characteristics of the church? Again, several of the defining characteristics we see, again, as I've said, through the ordinary means of grace, word, sacrament, or prayer. And then my final question with this one, is every Christian a member of Christ's church? Is every Christian a member of the Catholic Church? Yes. So what does this teach us about membership and service in the local church? What does it teach us if we are all members of Christ's church, if we're all members of the Catholic Church, what does this teach us about membership and service in the local church. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the things that astounds me is, is when you are in conversation with uh, an, an evangelical that will say something along the lines of, you know, well, I don't really, you know, attend church where I want to or where I go or what have you, and I don't really think that membership is I- I- important, but, you know, we're all part of, of, of the church. Well, th- that is to dismiss the bulk of the New Testament. Paul's writing his epistles to local church. Church is just like us. Local churches, specific people. Paul's not writing and going, well, I'm, right, I'm going to call this Ephesians. But really, I'm talking about, you know, everywhere, anywhere. Well, of course, we are, as the, as the Catholic Church, we are a beneficiaries of that. But initially, those points that Paul addresses, 1 Corinthians is a better example, those points that Paul addresses specifically are real-life, real-time problems in a local church that he's addressing. We are beneficiaries of that. But as members of the Catholic Church, we are to engage with a local church, and then once we have engaged, and by that we use the term membership, once we become members of the local church, what then? Community, fellowship, koinonia is the, is the, is the Greek word. We're, we're doing life together. We're living life together, and that includes the use of your gifts. Is there any believer <clears throat> who is not gifted by the Holy Spirit? No. Every single believer is gifted by the Holy Spirit. There's debate over whether that's one gift or multiple gifts. Don't care, not arguing. The point is, is that all of us are gifted. And that means that within the church, we are to use those gifts in a myriad of different ways. Sometimes obvious, sometimes less obvious, but always using our gifts. All right, question number 55. What do you understand by the communion of saints? Again, we're working our way through the Apostles' Creed. We're to that portion on, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Answer, first, that believers one and all, as members of this community, share in Christ and in all His treasures and gifts. Ding, 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 right? Second, that each member should consider it a duty to use these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of other members. I mean, this is not archaic, is it? I mean, th- th- this is applicable as applicable then as it is today. So my question is, as Christ's church, what do we all share in Him? Well, you look at the first answer. We all share in Christ in His treasures and gifts. His treasures and gifts. We are joint heirs, Scripture tells us, with Christ. 
receiving the same eternal inheritance that is guaranteed him, so also guaranteed us, and so also given gifts to be put to work now. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He goes on to say, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. So, what do we all share in Him? We all share treasures and gifts. Next question. Why is it important that we use our spiritual gifts in service to Christ's church? Why is it important that you use your gifts? Why is it important that I use my gifts in service to Christ's church? What's that? Yeah, I mean, and, and you think about it, it, it for lack of record, for the point of the recording, Chris said the edification of the church, the building of the, the body. Think about that in a negative sense. If you have a gift, if I have a gift and I am not using that gift, uh, what's the terminology? I love this. Um, if I'm not using it readily and joyfully, <laughs> if I'm not using it readily and joyfully, it is of disadvantage to the church because God assembles a people by His Holy Spirit with the intent that you and I will use our gifts to serve within that local body. And let me, for the little bit of time that we have, let me just, on a very practical sense, chase this rabbit for just one second. Um, I, I understand that many people... Uh, will because of either age or limited resources or commitments with, with work or family or other responsibilities or, or in, in some cases just a lack of knowledge. I realize that not everyone um, will have a clear indication of what your gift is or how you would use your gift. Um, I understand that. And I also understand that there are some gifts that are, are uh, more uh, public. So my, my, my gifting is, is in, you know, in, in public. And so you see it and you go, well, that's real obvious, John. I get it, but, but what about me? And we also know that gifting within the church, there's some that is behind the scenes and there's some that is, is more public. But, but here's the thing that I want to encourage you with is don't get hung up in trying to fill out a multiple choice or a a written survey or some kind of test to help you to to figure out what your spiritual gift is. That's a waste of time. The best thing that you can do is find an area in the church and serve. Just, just, Just find it. Because here's what God will do through His Spirit, then He will use your unique gifting then to serve uniquely in that way. Now, I'll give you a bizarre example, but a true one. Is I remember hearing a pastor one time say that there was a, a man who was of, of lower intellect, had some disadvantages mentally, but he had a passion for God's Word, and he had a passion for teaching God's Word, and yet he was neither educated nor equipped. So he drove the bus. He drove the bus to get kids to Sunday school so they could be taught the Word of God. And (laughs) it just grips my heart when I think about that because I think even a man of a low IQ even him can still use his gift of teaching in an unusual way of driving a bus. So you find your version of driving a bus at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Find where it is. Maybe it's in service. Maybe it's in hospitality. Maybe it's in a way that that you've never even thought of it before. But if you will start serving, then God will use your gifting in different ways. 
I'll give you one last example before I go to the last question. We had a, a couple, a family that went to this church once upon a time, and uh, the woman uh, decided that she was going to serve in the nursery. And so she started serving in the nursery. Well, her gifting was teaching. Now, you know where, where this goes, don't you? You walk into the nursery, and all of a sudden, all these little toddlers, she's got books open. She's teaching them memory verses. She's teaching them, this is, this is what, and I'm like, I just know, I just, just changed the diapers. And so you got, no, she's a teacher, and she's using her gift, but she was using it somewhere that was unexpected. All right, I have run out of time, haven't I? All right, so the last question, we'll read it and answer it, and then if we have time, we'll touch on it next week. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, by grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. Woo! That's a good one to end on. We'll, I, I promise we'll come back to this uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but let this be a send-off to us because we're going over to assemble as forgiven sinners. We're going to assemble in, in worship as those who are born with a sin nature. And yet, through faith in Christ Jesus, we're forgiven and God has forgotten, no longer remembers any of our sins, but rather has freed us from judgment, uniting us in Christ forever. Let me pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for this truth. And it's a beautiful truth to end on. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that we are forgiven sinners that we stand in righteousness before you, not for our works nor merits, but only in Christ Jesus through faith in Him. And so we pray that you would prepare our hearts for worship. May you be exalted through the assembly of your people today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.